You want to know why I killed? You want to know how it happened? You want to know why I did what I did? Mallory was the first. He was a mean motherfucker. He asked me if I wanted to smoke a joint, and I told him I don't really smoke, but he should do whatever he felt like doing. It didn't bother me. We had some drink, and I don't know what kind of liquor it was. And then I asked him if he wanted to help me make some money, and he was interested. So we go, we stop someplace out on US-1, we spent the night drinking. And then he says, do you want to make your money now? We were in the front seat. He was hugging and kissing me. Then he starts to push me down. Wait a minute, I told him. Get cool. You don't have to get rough, you know. Let's just have fun. Tells me he's been waiting for this all night long. So I told him, well, I take my money first. He says he wants to see how the merchandise fits and unzips his pants. And he tells me, why don't I disrobe? Why do I still have clothes on? And then he's gonna fuck me. He's gonna fuck me here and now. I told him, no, no, you're not just gonna fuck me. And he starts to get violent, the son of a bitch. He's holding me down. He's gonna try to rape me. My bag was unzipped. I wanted to make sure that if things got ugly, I could use my gun. He was gonna rape me, take my money, beat me up, whatever the hell he was gonna do. I jumped out of the car with my bag and grabbed the gun. Get out of the car. What? What's going on? You son of a bitch. I know you were gonna rape me. No. No, I wasn't. You knew you were gonna try and rape me, man. I shot him. Shot him right in the arm. I didn't aim, but then I shot him another three or four times. He begged for help. I didn't know what to do. I figured if I help this guy and he lives, he's gonna tell on me and I'm gonna get it for attempted murder. So I thought the best thing to do was just keep shooting him. And then I thought, hell, he deserves to die. He deserves to die what he tried to do to me. If I don't kill him, he'll try to shoot me. And then maybe he'll go and rape someone else. So I watched him die. Same thoughts went through my head every time I killed someone. The guy with the 45, I shot him more than nine times. I was pissed off when I found the gun on top of the car. Fucking bastard. You were going to blow my brains out. He called me a bitch and started getting physical, and I shot him in the back seat of the car. I reloaded the gun and shot him some more. Then I drove to 52 and dumped the body. I know, I'm probably looking at death, but I just want to get right with God. I don't have a family, so I don't understand the pain I caused the family of these guys. When my stepmother, actually my grandmother, died, my stepdad, grandfather, wouldn't let me stay at home. I was living on the street. I had lots of guys, maybe 10, 12 a week. On a normal day, we'd just do it by the side of the road, behind a building, off the road in the woods if they wanted it all. I was used to sex. Kids at school used to fuck me, so did my own brother. Really inside, right inside me, I'm a good person. I've been with loads of men. I've gone through at least 250,000 guys in my life. I became good friends with some of them. They really liked me. They always wanted to see me again. But when the Johns started messing with me, I'd get just as violent as they would get on me. I'd love to tell that to their families. I know they must think I'm a stupid bitch, but what they have to realize is no matter how much they love the people that died, no matter how much they loved them, they were bad people. They were gonna hurt me. They have to realize this fact that this person, no matter how much they loved them or how good they felt the person was, this person was going to physically beat me up, rape me, or kill me. I just turned it around and did my fair play before I got hurt, see? They started getting radical on me, and I just did what I had to do. I've been betrayed my whole fucking life, you know? My parents betrayed me, my grandparents. Men betrayed me, the fucking cops betrayed me, even friends. I've had enough shit in my life. I mean, what about the cops? Lying, cheating motherfuckers. I was cleaning the streets up for them. And now, a raped woman gets executed. You are all an inhumane bunch of lying men and bitches. Go ahead, put me in the electric chair. You're all gonna get nuked in the end.
We're going to talk today about Eileen Warnos. I'm going to refer to her as Lee. We're going to tell her story. How did she end up being a female serial killer? So in order to know the end of the story, we're going to start at the beginning of the story. The beginning is Eileen was born February 29th on a Wednesday in Michigan, 1956. She was born to teenage parents, Diane Warnos and Dale Pittman. It's been said that her mother was between the ages of 14 and 16 when she gave birth to her and her dad was 19. Her, his grandparents, Dale's grandparents, had to lie about their ages because they were underage. So they had already had one son, Keith, who was two years older than Eileen was, and right before giving birth to Lee, Diane and Dale split up. Dale was a troubled guy. He was diagnosed schizophrenic, he was in and out of jail, and he ended up with life in prison. The reason he ended up with that was because he kidnapped, raped, and attempted to murder a seven-year-old child. So he was sentenced to life in prison. While in prison, he fashioned a noose out of a bed sheet and he hung himself. So instead of taking responsibility and doing life, he ended it. He sounds like a really, really sweet guy. When Eileen was about four years old, her mother dropped her off at her grandparents' house with her brother and asked them to babysit. They said yes. And a short time later, she called crying, saying that she would not be returning. And she never did. So now Eileen is four years old, Lee's four years old. She's never met her father. He was in prison before she was born. And her mother has now dropped her off at her grandparents' house and never returns again. So in 1960, Lori, which is her grandfather, and Britta, her grandmother, adopted the two children. They did not tell them that they were adopted or that they were in fact their grandparents. So as far as the kids knew, these were their parents. Lori, the grandfather, was a heavy drinker, a heavy disciplinarian. He worked hard. He worked at a Ford factory. So he would work all day. He would come home. He would drink. And he would find a reason to discipline the children. And it's been said that he kept a leather belt hanging behind his door. And in most of these cases where you're talking about a serial killer or a deranged person, many of them were abused as children, and it's no different for Lee. She claims that when she was disciplined, she was the one who had to soak down and condition the leather belt. She would be forced to lay naked, spread eagle on her face, while being beaten by her grandfather. He would say things to her like, you're worthless. You're not worth the air that you're breathing. And it could be a small thing that she did or something big. She was kind of an unruly kid who had something inside of her that pushed her to disobey. Um, but it's also been said that he had a very bad temper and he would discipline them for the slightest of things. So who really knows? Uh, the neighborhood said that it was a very private family. Nobody really knew a lot about Lori and Britta or the children. They would keep the curtains tightly closed. Nobody was invited over. They didn't have, you know, guests for dinner or people around to get to know them. They were just very private people. When Lee was about six years old, she became fascinated with lighter fluid and matches. And she ended up lighting her face and, you know, parts of her body on fire accidentally. And she ended up with some scars. And of course she was, you know, disciplined for this because she's a six year old child playing with matches and lighter fluid, which is extremely dangerous. And she ended up getting burnt. 
uh, a lot of the kids remember that she was bruised often. My assumption is from being disciplined by her grandfather, but she would come out with bruises on her face and her arms and her legs and nobody was really concerned because nobody was very close to Lee. She was known as a kid who was there. There were a lot of kids in the neighborhood and they would go down and hang out at this place called the pit. You know, they're seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, whatever it is. And they would go hang out and she would be there, but not included in what was going on with the other kids. You know, there's a lot of the kiddie stuff happening and playing the games that kids play and flirting and, you know, being kids. Meanwhile, some of those same kids were getting sexual favors from Lee and paying her with cigarettes. They ended up giving her the nickname the Cigarette Pig or the Cigarette Bandit. This is a little child we're talking about here, but that's the story that's been told. So that happened and she was sexually active very, very young. It was rumored that her grandfather was having sex with her. It was also widely known that her and her brother Keith were sexually active together. Uh, when she was around nine years old, she again lit something on fire. And this time it badly scarred her face and her body. She was in the hospital for several days and it was months of recovery time. The physical scars that Lee ended up with in the end, I think are nothing compared to what her emotional scars were that propelled her a bit, you know, it's not the only reason, but it propelled her a bit to become who she became, right? Around age 11, Lee learned that the only parents she had ever known, Lori and Britta, were not her parents at all. And again, Lee was an unruly kid already. She was a kid who wasn't going to always follow the rules. So combine that with now feeling deceived and fooled. And now she's really angry because this man who's abusing her physically, sexually, emotionally, verbally, isn't even her dad. Not that it would make it any better if it was, but she felt like she was deceived all over again. So not only was she an unruly child who didn't listen very well, now she was angry and defiant and she began to act out. She knew she would act out and her grandparents would end up kicking her out of the house because they couldn't handle her. And at one point around 11 years old, she was thrown out and she went and slept in the woods with some man for a few days, exchanging her body for money. She ended up going back home. And shortly after that, she was thrown out again. And Lee did have one friend. Her name was Dawn. And Dawn stayed friends with Lee throughout her life, all the way to the very end of her life. So they would hitchhike. And you'll see that hitchhiking became a thing <laughs> over Lee's entire life, all the way up till the very end. Hitchhiking was quite a thing for her. So her and Dawn hitchhiked. They would go here and go there. And a lot of the time, Lee used her body. By this point, she was a heavy drinker and she discovered drugs. She's not even a teenager yet. There were mornings she would wake up and not know if she had sex or who she had sex with, if it was one partner or multiple partners. So she's doing downer drugs to numb the pain. She's drinking, she's having sex, she's hitchhiking, which is extremely dangerous. And then she would go back home and she would try to be quote unquote normal and attend school and do all of that. At around 14, she lit some toilet paper and other things on fire in the girl's bathroom. And 
one of her teachers said, quote, it is vital for this girl's welfare that she seeks counseling immediately, end quote. Based on what I've told you, do you think that somebody stepped in and got counseling for Lee? If you said no, you would be correct. Nobody did. By age 15, Lee was pregnant. There were rumors on who the dad could be. Was it Keith? Was it her grandfather? Or was it this old man down the street who I believe was a friend of her grandfather's, Mr. Porlock? He would allow Lee to come to his house to listen to his uh, record player because they didn't have one and Lee loved music. So he would allow this. He was an old man. He would watch Lee dance around while he just sat there smiling at her. And on occasion, he would put her in his lap and give her lots of compliments and give her money in exchange for her dancing? I don't think so. So nobody ever knew, though, who the dad was of the baby. And she was sent away to a home for unwed mothers. And in January of 1971, she gave birth to a baby boy. The baby was immediately taken away from her and put up for adoption. Think about that. There is a man, maybe now, walking around who is the child of Eileen Warnos. She never did get to see the kid again, and she moved on. In July of that same year, her grandmother passed away. And there's not a lot known about her grandmother. You know, did she know what was going on in the house? Did she allow what was happening to Lee and her brother? I don't know. But when she passed away, it sent Lori over the edge. He went to his basement. He put several inches of water in the basement. And then he stood there with the power on trying to electrocute himself and end his life. But it didn't work. So he came up with another idea to gas himself in his car in his garage. And that did work. Lee claims that she found him, but later, much later in the years after Lee is caught for doing the things that she did, his biological son said he's the one who found him. And you'll notice a pattern here with Lee. She'll tell a story and then there's a different account of the story the things that I can find out about her childhood, a lot of it did come from people who spoke up after she had been arrested. The things about the bruises and having sex with all of these people and not really being cared about in the community by the other kids. So those are verifiable things that we know very likely happened. I don't know for sure if her grandfather was sexually abusing her or not, but Lee says she showed up to his funeral simply to blow smoke in his face and to leave. So now Lee was basically on her own. That was it. She started traveling, hitchhiking again. That was her thing. And many times she was arrested in the coming years. She was arrested for things like disorderly conduct and drunk driving, and one time for shooting a gun out of a moving vehicle. During her adventures, she ends up meeting Louis Gratzfell. He is a 69-year-old multimillionaire. He's like the president of a yacht club, and he made these investments. And he's driving, and he picks up this beautiful blonde. And let me say this. Lee didn't look like what we saw in the movie Monster or what we saw of her later on in life. She had gone through quite a bit by the time we saw her that way. Uh, she was very pretty. She had a beautiful body, nice smile. She seemed charming. Um, what lied beneath was something completely different. But Lewis was kind of smitten with her. And very quickly, he gave her a huge engagement ring, asked her to marry him, and she said yes. Lewis was looking for a wife. 
he was looking for someone who would be at home, somebody he could put on his arm, be proud to bring out. That definitely was not going to be Lee. Lee was looking for security, and it seems she always found older men. Always. But this time, she married him, and she was not prepared to change in the least bit. Nothing was going to change for her. He wanted her to be at home. So he says to her one time, you need to be respecting your elders. And for that, she punched him in his face and left him with a black eye. So you would think Lewis would have learned right then and there, but he did not. He tried another trick. He tried to talk to her, to tell her what he needed and that he would appreciate her being at home. But Lee was not one to be at home, period. So she, she really enjoyed dive bars, really. She wanted to go out, she wanted to play pool, she wanted to hear music, she wanted to flirt, and that's exactly what she did. One night, she ends up in this bar called Bernie's Bar, Bernie's Club, and she's pretty intoxicated at this point. She's playing pool, she's flirting with men and women and everybody, and the more she drinks, the worse things get. She gets louder and more arrogant, more boisterous, She's causing kind of a scene for no reason. And people complained and the manager came over and said, that's it, this pool table's closed. And he and Lee began to argue. And Lee's a fighter. She enjoys it. So the manager was kind of bewildered with her. Why are you freaking out? You know, it's time for you to go. And he turns his back to walk away and she picks up a pool cue and throws it at his head the cue ball, you know, and somebody yells duck. And luckily he did because the ball became lodged in the wall. That's the amount of force she used to throw the ball at this man. So of course he called the police and she was arrested and her friend went through her Lee's bag and found $1,400 and was able to bail her out. And of course, her husband was not happy with this. You know, my wife is out here in bars getting arrested and being drunk. So he ends up telling her, like he had told other wives when he had issues with them, I will cut your allowance. And for that, she beat him with his own cane. He is a 69-year-old man, and Lee beat him in his own home with his cane. He immediately filed for an annulment. They had not been married very long and a restraining order. Now you'd think Lee's security is being upset and she would be beside herself, but she didn't care. She went to the pawn shop, she pawned the ring, and a couple of days later, her brother Keith passed away from throat cancer. She ends up going to the funeral just in time as it was ending to put a rose in his hand and you know, while she's there, strangely, and there's not a lot that I've found about this part, her mother was there. Diane was there. She came in. She flew in from Texas for her son's funeral. How she knew about it, I don't know. But I really wanted to know, did the two women talk? Did she ever get the answer of why? But I don't know that part. In any case, now her brother's gone too. Lee is truly alone. Her husband is now gone. She's still drinking. She's by herself. So Lewis, you know, moved on. A couple days later, uh, or a couple weeks later, a $10,000 life insurance policy comes through from her brother to her. So now she's got $10,000. It's a pretty good amount of money for back then. She puts a down payment on a black Pontiac, which is repossessed pretty quickly because she went through all of the money in a couple of months. So she has this nice car, she's drinking and driving in it, running around, and uh, it gets repossessed. So she's back on the road, hitchhiking yet again. She finds this older man, and she, she actually did fall in love with this man for a bit. 
he had pretty kind things to say about her. There was nothing bad. Um, he did say that she had a pretty bad temper. And overall, they got along very well. So they're living together. And one night they get into this argument and Lee was not one who could just let things go very quickly. She really was putting in a bit of effort in this relationship. So the argument from the night before, she wakes up in the morning and she's still mad. So she takes his car, she goes to the pawn shop and she buys a gun. She then goes to a convenience store and buys some beer and some snacks. And I have notes uh, because Lee says a lot of things, so I want to make sure that I'm quoting it properly. She says, quote, I was fed up with living. I had no car, no money, no family, no nothing. I had tried to join the service, but you need 42 points, and I always missed by exactly five points, so I was just going to kill myself. I drank a case of beer and a quart of whiskey, and I took four reds. I went into a store and got beer and Slim Jims. I had $118 on me. I walked up to pay and my gun was sticking out and the woman started screaming about how I was going to rob the store. End quote there. So, <laughs> this woman sees her gun, allegedly, and she thinks she's going to rob her. Now, Lee tells a lot of stories. She says a lot of things. And then you find another account where she took that back and it, it's changed a bit. So I guess because the lady thought she might rob her, she said, oh, okay, you think I'm going to rob you? Now I'm going to rob you. Give me the money. And all the lady had was $33. So she's drunk at this point, and she takes off in the car, and the radiator blows out. Lee, mind you, is in some cutoff shorts and a bikini top at this point. So she knows the police are going to be looking for her. She ditches her shorts. Now she's in a bikini. The police come and she's arrested for armed robbery. That's that on that. She ends up serving 14 months in the Florida Correctional Center for armed robbery. I mean, things are getting worse here for Lee. She's disciplined in prison because she cannot follow orders. She just can't do it. It's not something that she's prepared to do. So she's fist fighting all of the time. She's not following orders. She's just doing all of the things. So she ends up getting this pen pal, a guy named Tom, right? She gets released in 1983. And Tom is used to his very sweet, nice pen pal that he's been talking to. And he allows her to move in. Well, he realized really quickly that Lee had issues that he could not deal with. But he was a nice person, so he tried to get her to go to therapy, in which she refused. She said, no, she's not going to do that, and she didn't want to do that, so she quickly moved on. And she couldn't keep out of trouble. You know, she's back, she's, she's in trouble. If we go over every single thing that Lee was in trouble for, we would be here until next week. So she forged some checks, she's skipping out on court, you know, she's, she's just, she's wild. She's out of control. She's traveling all over the place. She's still drinking. And she meets this woman named Tony. This is going to be Lee's first lesbian relationship, Tony. Seems Tony was a bit of a con artist herself. Lee is usually the one doing things to other people, right? But this time, her and Tony begin to plan you know, they're making plans together. And it suggested that they buy a steam cleaning business. So they do. They buy the, all of the equipment and all of the stuff. And they're staying like in a motel or whatever. And one day, Lee comes home. Tony's gone. The steam cleaning equipment is gone. And she leaves her like a $400 phone bill to pay. And Lee was beside herself. Because typically, Lee's the one you know, going out on the road and screwing people over and taking their stuff and beating people up. But this time, it was Tony who did that to her. And she, she did make quite a big deal out of it. She's, she has spoken on what happened and feels so angry that somebody took away her what was going to be the career for the rest of her life, right? 
So that happens, and now she's back out getting arrested and doing the stuff. She meets a woman named Tyria. Now, we're going to call her Ty, because that's what everybody knows her as, Ty. She meets Ty in a bar. And it starts off very awkward for the two of them. Uh, Ty is a Bible reading woman who feels that God does not want her to be in a lesbian relationship. And for whatever reason, Lee was intriguing enough for Ty to want to pursue something with her. So the two of them move in with this couple uh, Cammy and I'm not sure of the other one's name, but their last name is Green. They begin to stay with them, and Ty starts the relationship off with the truth. You know, she's telling her about her religion and her life, and Lee starts the relationship with a lie. She tells Ty that she owns a steam cleaning business, and she literally leaves the house every day with a briefcase. Right? She leaves every day like she's going to work somewhere. I don't know. We know what she was doing. So one day she comes home and she's got a black eye. And she says that she was forcefully, forcefully raped by somebody for six hours. And, you know, she escaped with her life. And Ty and Lee, I don't know if they go to the hospital. I don't know where they go, but they leave the house. Cammy Green, she doesn't believe the story. She knows that there's something not right here. So as soon as they leave, she opens the briefcase and inside she finds only men's business cards and condoms. So she tries to tell Ty, who's a friend of hers, you know, this is what's in the briefcase. And Ty ignores it. She acts like, it's not really a big deal. But Cammy is not happy about this situation at all. She knows that Lee is up to something no good. Eventually, Cammy asked them to leave, and they did. Uh, at the time that they were staying there, they were sleeping in separate beds because of Ty's religion and her belief in God and having a lesbian relationship. But Lee was okay with that. She cared about Ty enough to respect that. But when they got kicked out, they ended up buying a mobile home, a trailer, and traveling. They ended up at this um, mobile home park, right? And when questioned about them later, people said that the two had quite a reputation for being very tough. They drank a lot. They would walk around in their underwear they would start fights, they would be extremely loud all the time. Somebody said that looking at Lee was like looking into the eyes of death, that she just had these dead eyes and that she was very scary. They were kicked out of the trailer park. I mean, Lee's been kicked out of a lot of places, but now you're getting kicked out of a trailer park because they were playing like this loud music and constantly drinking and just being completely ridiculous. So it seems Lee has found her match with Ty. Even though Ty was supposed to be this, you know, religious, sweet woman. Well, you'll hear more soon about Ty and exactly who she was. So Lee continued. You know, they, they ended up losing the trailer somehow. And now they're back staying in motel rooms. And Lee is paying for the motel rooms with no job. It's very believed that Ty knew exactly what Lee was doing. That she was out prostituting herself in order to support the couple. How much exactly did Tyria Moore know about what Lee was doing? My personal opinion is she knew a lot, a lot more than she ever admitted to. We're going to get into the men that ultimately lost their lives to Lee and perhaps even to Ty. 
but I'll let you be the judge of whether you believe that Ty was involved or not. Richard Mallory, 51 years old, was an electronics repair man. He owned an electronics store in Clearwater, Florida. He was a quiet guy. He was a very heavy drinker, like many of the men who Miss Lee has met up with so far. He had a um, desire for some really kinky things. He was known to be very heavily in debt because he was spending his money on prostitutes for the most part. And due to this need that he had for liquor and drugs and women, he was behind on his rent. He had to be audited soon, it was coming up. His credit cards have been closed and he was paying for everything in cash. He would often close the store early and just take off. So people were kind of used to him not being around. Nobody really thought much of it when he didn't show up in, in, at his own place of business. He was also divorced five times, maybe due to his strange sexual needs. I'm not really sure why he was divorced, but one night he was in Daytona and he sees Lee and uh, they get together and they start driving around and soon he knows exactly what she's doing. Uh, Lee and Ty were arguing at this point, so Lee wasn't really in a huge hurry to get back home to her. So them driving around until four or five o'clock in the morning was okay with her. At one point, they pull over after drinking all night long. They're both pretty intoxicated at this point, and he asks her if she wants to make her money now. And he was pretty aggressive about it, according to her. And she told him, you know, you got to cool out. What are, you, what are you doing? And as the story went, and she's the only witness to it, unfortunately, he wanted her to strip her clothes off. Um, but he wasn't going to strip his clothes off. And he wanted her to perform oral sex. So she wanted the money first. And he began to get aggressive. She says that he ended up tying her up and she got loose. Whether this is true or not, um, I'm not sure. Remember, Lee was pretty tough. Uh, one story was that he did not pay her and that's why they got into it. The other story was he did pay her, her but he also raped her. In any case, Lee shot him several times. Then she took his Cadillac and drove it away and left it there. On December 1st of 1989, an officer ended up discovering the car and within, from outside looking into the car, he could see that there was blood inside of the car. Now this had all happened days before. So his, her, she took the car, she abandoned the car, Nearby the car was Mallory's wallet with some of his identification in it, as well as condoms and beer cans and other things. And it wasn't, this is December 1st that the car is found. Now, December 13th, some people end up finding Mallory's body. So they stumble across that. And there wasn't really a lot of um, attention given to Mallory's case at all. I mean, he was, he was no longer a married man. He wasn't very well liked. So Lee was able to get away with it for a while. It's said that when Lee got back home to Tyra, to Ty, she ended up giving her a scarf that belonged to Mallory and some other items. On December 6th, before Mallory's body is even found, Lee takes some of the equipment that she found in Mallory's car and goes to the pawn shop with it. I think she a camera and a radar detector. She got $35, but her thumbprint was required. So now her thumbprint was on file 
for pawning Mallory's stuff. Unfortunately, nobody really looked for Mallory's stuff. Uh, his employees weren't very concerned that he was gone. The police were not putting out this huge investigation. So they discovered his body, his identification. They did not connect it to the car, nor did they connect it to the pawn shop, which had Lee's fingerprint in it. On Friday, May 18th, 1990, David Spear was traveling on I-75 in Tampa. He saw Lee hitchhiking and he pulled over to pick her up. Lee was needing to go in the exact opposite direction of where Spear was headed, but he said that he would take her, that becoming a 150 mile round trip for him, but he was a very nice man, so he said that he would do it. Lee would be the last person to ever see David alive again. His body was found on June 1st, several weeks later. He was nude and his body was badly decomposed. He was identified through dental records, unfortunately. He died from six bullet wounds to the torso. His truck was located and the driver's seat was pulled up very close to the steering wheel. And this is something that we'll notice in each of the situations. Every time the seat is pulled up and David was six feet, four inches tall. Lee was five foot four. Now I hadn't said that before. She was only five foot four. She was a small woman. She was not very big at all. And for whatever reason, and however she did it, whether it was alone or with Ty, I'm still not convinced, but she was able to kill these men. So David's body is discovered. The next person, May 1990, is 40-year-old Charles or Chuck. His last name is a little bit difficult. Karskadon. <laughs> he was traveling from Missouri to Tampa to pick up his fiance. Chuck made the fatal mistake, like the rest of these men, of picking up Lee. She claimed she killed him in self-defense, but she switched the story to it was also for money and then back to self-defense. She says that she shot him nine times because as they were getting ready to have sex, you know, prostitution, she saw his 45 caliber gun on the hood of his car or on the roof of his car and she assumed that he was going to kill her. So she shot him nine times. In June of 1990, Peter Seams was a 65-year-old retired merchant seaman living in Jupiter, Florida. He was deeply religious. Neighbors often saw him loading up his car with Bibles and flyers to go out and spread the word. It's just what he did. He had plans of driving to Arkansas and New Jersey to visit family. He still had his car loaded up with the Bibles, though. He was supposed to call his wife on during the trip, but the call never came because he had run across Lee. Possibly Ty. This is where the Ty theory comes in for me. I'm not 100% sure, but there were witnesses after this whole situation, two months after he disappeared. A call came in about an abandoned car. And this abandoned vehicle turned out to be Peter's car. There was a bloody print inside of the car that was not tested. The car had been crashed by Lee and Ty, according to witnesses, and they claimed the driver was Ty, not Lee. So I guess when the crash happened, uh, they kind of went off down into a ditch and then jumped out of the car and somebody tried to help them and they just screamed at them, you know, to leave them alone. But all the while there were witnesses sitting on a porch that saw all of this go down. So they were both drinking, of course. 
The really sad part is Peter's body was never located. He was one of the ones who were never located. I'm thinking there were more victims than this. I don't know if she just stopped at these men, but as of right now, all of the ones that they know about, the bodies have been recovered, all except for Peter. In July of 1990, Eugene Troy Burris, he was a part-time salesman for a sausage delivering company. He was reliable, he was very happy, he was traveling, and he was supposed to report to his office at the end of the day. That never happened, obviously, and this was very much unlike him. So his manager called his wife. His wife ends up reporting him missing. Uh, he was a very responsible family guy. There was no way that he wouldn't have done what he was supposed to do. The police response was very fast, and his van was located within a few miles of where he was supposed to be. The van was locked. The keys were missing, of course, and a week later, a family stumbled across Troy's body in a park. According to Lee, we find out later on, Troy picked her up, took her into the woods, and told her to strip, threw $10 at her, and told her that that was all she was worth. So she shot him in the chest, and because she was mad, at the insult, she shot him in the back as well. On September 12th of 1990, two young boys riding their bikes came across the body of Charles Richard Humphreys. He was a 56-year-old child abuse investigator. He also was trying to do good by helping children, but he had been shot six times. And several counties were investigating what was going on with all of these other cases. They ended up finding Humphrey's car abandoned near a gas station. And what we do know that happened is he left his office on September 11th, and he only had a very short drive home. It would not have been long at all. So on his way home, he has to pass by this convenience store. And around 4 p.m., according to receipts, he did. The two people who were in the store were Lee and Ty. It's assumed that he ended up giving them a ride. And he was killed. Much like everybody else. Walter Antonio was 60 years old. He was a trucker and also had a side job as a reserve police officer. He was on his way to drive to Alabama. He was recently engaged. Uh, you know, he was a happy guy. He was driving a maroon uh, Pontiac Grand Prix. He was wearing a gold and silver diamond ring, which was a gift from his fiance. On November 19th of 1990, he's found dead near a remote logging road in Lee's typical dumping grounds. He was found nearly nude. He had been shot four times. Police said his car was found five days later in a completely different county, but before it was found there, it had been parked at the motel that Lee and Ty were staying at. Lee told the clerk that it was her boyfriend's car and he was married, so he didn't want anybody to know so she just needed to park it there for a little bit. That came out later. Also, the gold and silver diamond ring that he was wearing, Lee ended up giving that, allegedly, to Tyra as a gift. Hello? Hi. Yes. Yes. Hi. Hey. Hey, I had to call you early because I didn't know if you were going to listen today or what. I don't, what the hell is going on, Lee? They've called, they've been up to my parents again. They've got my sister now asking her questions. I don't know what the hell's going on. Huh. Where are they asking your sister questions? I don't know. Hmm. If, Lee, they're, they're coming after me. I know they are. No, they're not. They're <laughs> 
They've got to. Then why are they asking so many questions then? Honey, listen, listen, listen. Do what you gotta do, okay? I'm gonna have to because I'm like gonna go to jail for something that you did. This is unfair. My family is a nervous wreck up there. My mom has been calling me all the time. She doesn't know what the hell's going on. Okay. You gotta do, okay? Alrighty. What? I'm not gonna let you go to jail. You evidently don't love me anymore. You don't trust me or anything. I mean, you're going to let me get in trouble for something that I didn't do. I said I'm not. <laughs> listen, quit crying. Listen. I can't help it. I'm scared shitless. I know. I love you a lot. I don't know whether I should keep on living or if I should... No, Ty, Ty, listen. <sighs> what if they don't believe me? Ty, run this thing. What? I'm not going to let you go to jail. Listen, I have to confess myself. Mm. Yes. Why the hell did you do this? Why did you do this? I don't know. Listen, Ty. Wait. I'll probably never be able to see you. Yes. I love you. If I have to confess everything just to keep you from getting trouble, I will. Okay. Don't worry, okay? Okay. I love you. No. We'll do it now. Get it over with. Right this very moment? Yes. Yeah, get it over with. All right. Okay? Okay. You can right call me back time. later. All right. All right. Okay, bye. And so there we are. Ty ended up working with the police to throw Lee under the bus. Now, if you listen to that closely, you'll hear Lee whispering, I'd confess to everything so that you wouldn't get in trouble. When they, the police, located Ty, she had items belonging to Humphreys and Reed in her possession. Additionally, a book deal and a movie deal were discussed with Ty by officers who were going to act as consultants. So we're going to listen to a little bit of that, too. Now, ultimately, uh, you ended up calling uh, Rose Giansanti about that, didn't you? I believe so. All right. Ms. Giansanti, we spoke to her before. She is, in fact, an agent with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Is she not? Yes, she is. And she's one of those individuals that was in the motel room with you before. Correct. And Ms. Giansanti, uh, you like to talk to her about things like that, right? I mean, she was somebody you trust. Correct. And you call her and ask her opinion on the book and movie deals. Correct. And when you did that, you spoke with her about uh, some monetary figures. Something that, yeah, it was mentioned. In fact, the figure mentioned is fifty thousand dollars, correct? That could have been, yes. Ultimately. Lee is put to death. She's convicted and she is put to death. Was she fairly put to death? Probably. She did the crime several times, but my main problem is Ty. I feel like she knew the whole time, every murder. Where in the world does she think that Lee was coming up with all of this stuff as a prostitute. She was out purchasing these cars and driving them back to the motels. Diamond rings, scarves, cameras, radar detectors. She was giving them to Lee uh, to tie as gifts. Where did she think she was getting them? I don't know. You can clearly see her face as she's testifying, and I can't play a lot of that here because court TV is not too free with their footage, but I will put it in the description if you'd like to watch the trial yourself. It's a crazy story, betrayed by the one she truly loved, betrayed by her parents, her dad, who was a disgusting man, her mom, 
who left her with her grandparents, her grandparents who didn't tell her that they were her grandparents, her brother who passed away. I don't know. Sometimes you can look at these cases and really feel like maybe this person was created. You know, maybe they weren't just born absolutely psychotic. You never really know. But in any case, I don't think it was fair for just Lee to be executed. I think Ty knew just as much. Let me know what you think down in the comments.